Hallelujah. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you for a minute, but you can go on and start turning to Exodus 14. So what you see is what you get. So you know who our pastor is, and you know that he likes to say, eyes to see, ears to hear, heart to understand, and the ambition to do the word. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about eyes to see. And for the religious crowd, I already know that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I'm not talking about that your faith is going to be what you see. We're going to focus more on spiritual eyes. We're going to be talking about how we can focus and develop those spiritual eyes tonight. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for that? Everyone say fresh eyes. Lord, may you give us fresh eyes tonight. And I'm going to hit on about six points, so I'll try to help you, those who are note takers, to keep up. And I do have these notes. I could always give them to you. But Exodus 14, verse 13 and 14 says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Amen? So number one point that we're going to make tonight is see his salvation and deliverance. So he fights on our behalf. We are not to stay stagnant and do nothing, but... He works with us, and we work with God. We heard at the conference this week, we don't work for God. We work with God. So that means anything that we do in our lives, it could be as simple as driving down the road, which sometimes that's not always simple, but it could be as simple as just uh, your job and just your day-to-day life, but we want God's help. We need God's help. Amen? Amen. So I wanted to make the point that when our sight is clouded with fear, first of all, we're told, fear not in this verse. And when we're focused focused on looking at our past bondage. So we know here that the children of Israel were delivered. But just from knowing our Bible, which we all should, and have the heart to, to, to know our Bible, is they kept looking back. They kept talking about their past, and it, it, it could probably be better back there than what we're dealing with now. But we're not to do that. We're not to be focused on our past. Our pastor recently said, how can you go forward in the things of God if you're looking in the rearview mirror? Yeah. Amen. And we're not called to be those who, are draw, who draw back. We're not supposed to be looking in the past. We know what happened with Lot's wife when she was looking at her past. So we're not supposed to do that. We have a heart to go forward and keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And, you know, sometimes we can busy ourselves with trying to fix our problems instead of just being still. So when we look back at Exodus, it says, it says and Moses said unto the people, fear not. So we cast off fear. It says, stand still. So why do we as Christians busy ourselves trying to put our hand to everything? We try to fix it. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Oh, I got to figure this out. I got to fix it. I got to fix it. And we put our hand on it instead of give it to God and allow him to work on our behalf. Amen. So sometimes we just need to stand still and let God be God. The other thing here is that we can't see God's salvation and his mighty wonders in our lives if we're living in fear, if we're not being still and trying to fix everything on our own, or if we keep looking to the past for the answers. We don't need to go back to the past. There's a reason why it's called the past. (laughs) We're of those who look for the future, toward the future. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, if you will, please. This is a Bible study. Is that okay with you guys if we do a Bible study? Let me tell you how this came about. I'm just going to take the little side road. So yesterday morning... It was probably around 3.30 in the morning. I was awoken by the Spirit of the Lord. 
I know it was the Lord because, of course, you're going to wake me up at 3.30 in the morning. And I start hearing this message, and I'm like, oh, oh, man, I'm so tired. But anyways, we'll just fast forward. And five hours of study later, this is what came out. And so to be obedient, I tell my husband after I type it, because I'm done, I typed it, I feel like, okay, I obeyed. I heard from the Lord. I didn't sit on it. I didn't say, uh, you know, just disregard it. But I was like, you know, if I'm being awakened in the middle of the night and this is impressing on my heart and I don't have peace until I study it out, that's God, right? Because we know when there's peace residing, that's of God. And so I, I was not getting peace until I sat down with my Bible and I looked up these scriptures and I wrote it out exactly how I had heard it and then also you know, uh, the Lord showed me new things and fresh eyes and um, typed it up. And, and then I gave it to my husband. And I said, you know, okay, here it is. I don't know if this is for Woven, meaning our women's discipleship group, if this is uh, necessarily just for me or if this is a word in due season for our church. But I'm obedient and I'm submitting this to you tear it apart, you know, look at it, read it, but I'm obedient, and I did it, and then I go to work, and, and now I'm t- teaching it tonight, so that was a pleasant surprise, but I'll say in his pastime, he really enjoys you guys doing Bible studies and typing them and giving them to him. You're welcome, so <laughs> I'm just playing. He didn't say that, but for me, that's what it turned out to be, so that's how we came here tonight. Okay, my second point this evening is, when we lose hope, we see no good. When we lose hope, we see no good. Turn with me to Job 7, and we're going to read verses 7 through 15. Job 7, verses 7 through 15, and this is Job lamenting. He says, Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall see no good, no more see good. Let me read that again. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall no more see good. The eye of him that has seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanished away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. I am a sea or a well that thou settest a watch over me. When I say, my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifies me through visions, so that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. I'm thinking that this sounds like Job is pretty hopeless. (laughs) Okay, we've all been there where everything looks dreary and dark and hopeless, and oh my goodness, how am I going to get out of this? All I can see is no good. I think we can all relate. We've had those stinking, thinking moments. We've had those moments where we just don't see how it's going to work out. That's where Job is currently. He's lost hope, and he sees no good. That first part says, mine eyes shall no more see good. So let's flip over because we're going to do just a quick study on Job. Go with me to Job 19. Is this okay, doing a Bible study, Pastor? Job 19, verse 25. And I'm just going to give this to you like it was given to me. So the first part, Job lamented. He's complaining. He's saying, I've lost hope. I don't see a way out. Why are these things happening to me? Woe is me. This next part, 
Job 19, verse 25 through 27. Now this is Job's statement of faith. Praise God. He says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another though my reins be consumed within me. So he's saying, you know, at this point, things look kind of dreary. I I still have this problem in my body. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's saying, I'm going to see God regardless. God lives. There's one true living God. I will see him. He is my redeemer. He's going to see me through one way or another. God's got me. So he's just, he's building himself up in his faith. And, and so, you know, that's encouraging for us because we have those days, like I said, where maybe circumstance and situation, we're trying to figure out how is this ever going to get better? It just seems like God is so far from me. But then we remember who God is. Amen. And this is the, the route in which we're traveling this evening through Job's story. But now we've come to a place where it's Job's statement of faith. My Redeemer lives One way or another, I shall see God. I shall see God. Okay, a few uh, chapters over, we're going to go to Job 42. Go a little bit further on his journey. Job 42. We're going to start at verse 1. Now, on on this part, this is where Job submits and repents. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered and understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here... I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and repent in dust dust and ashes. So here he's saying, you know, I know that My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. He's understanding who God is. And even though God seemed far from him, and at the time he didn't understand it, he couldn't make sense of it, he knows now, God, you're wonderful. You're magnificent. You are present. You are real. You have had me since go. And he's he's submitting, and he's just saying, my eyes see now. They see, I didn't understand before, and we know he had some, you know, poor doctrine of the Lord giveth and taketh away. Um, We know that that's not true. That's that's the enemy who came to steal and kill and destroy. And I look back on the, and you don't have to go back here, but where it said in Job 7, I think it was around verse 14, he, he was talking about when he closes his eyes, he's even tormented in his sleep. We know that God wasn't in on that. That wasn't of God. Um, It said that uh, scares me with dreams, terrifies me with visions, strangling, you know, feeling death. That's not of God. That's the enemy. So we know that he had a little bit of poor doctrine back then. Um, This is way before, obviously, the word of God was given to us. But he's saying here, I may not understand it all. And we're not supposed to lean on our own understanding. We're supposed to trust in him, and we're supposed to allow him to direct our paths and and put all our trust in him because he will see us through. And he's already said that his Redeemer lives. He knows that he can cast his trust um, on the Lord, that he can cast his problems on the Lord, but put his trust in him to deliver him and see, see it through. Uh, but then we see here that it says that his eyes are focused on God. And now he's starting to see not just who God is, but that God never left him. He was always there. He was always there no matter what he was going through. 
And see, and the Lord was still for him. God was for him. He may have allowed these trials, but he was saying, don't kill him. That's mine. And so he never left him. His hand was on him. He did have to take his hands off for these things to come to pass. But he was watchful. And he was always with him wherever Job was and whatever he went through. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this next part, we're going to, it's still in Job 42. So let's look at verse 12, just a couple verses over. Now this part is Job is blessed. Amen. Amen. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. And we'll stop right there because so far we've heard that Job was complaining. He was under attack. He didn't know how he's going to get through it. Then he starts proclaiming his faith that I've, I've always served you, God. And we know that Job served him because God said, have you considered my servant Job? I mean, he was favored of God, so we know that he was faithful to God. So here he remembers, I, this is what I do. I live for God. I serve God. So he starts proclaiming his faith. And then he submits and repents. And the next part, because of that, that uh, journey, then Job is blessed. We serve a God of restoration. So sometimes when it feels like the enemy is taking and taking and you're losing ground or you're losing hope, we know that God can restore all things. Amen. Amen. And we have the Holy Spirit who gives us hope. He's our comforter. That's one of his names. So Job was blessed in the end because he submitted, because he proclaimed faith, and because he repented. And God restored everything that the enemy meant for harm and everything that the enemy took from him. And he got more. Praise God for being faithful. And how many people in here have seen where you've lost something, but you got it back so much the more because you held on and you trusted God? I mean, I can share a testimony as far as Pastor and I, and, and I know he has shared it from the pulpit before, but we had lost our home, most of our things, in a fire, a house fire. And praise God, we weren't home. We were staying with a family member and ministering to them because they had just experienced a terrible, tragic loss. We all had, but we weren't home. But had we been home, where the fire had started was downstairs, but those flames went to the upstairs and was underneath our son's bed, had burned through the ceiling. Our son would have been in that fire, and we lost most of our things. But what I want to tell you is, for a moment, we were a little downcast that day because it was hard to walk through our home. They allowed us to go in and to see the damage and the loss. Um, And when you look at your baby's things and all your memories, like we lost most of our um, marriage pictures, a lot of baby items, just things that meant something to us. That was more important than the stuff. So a tear may have been shed here or there, but Pastor was smiling, and he started praising God that we were alive and we we were okay, and we weren't home when it happened, and we had each other, and and then I mean, and that was just alone. That's a testimony of faith, and so when I'm seeing him laugh and when I'm seeing him praise God. Well, that lifts my spirits, and I start getting convicted of, well, why am I downcast? Why am I crying? God's always carried us through. Amen? And he did. So I want to tell you that just as Job had lost and felt restoration, our community came together. There were people that were coming. I remember one lady gave me all new bedding, a beautiful uh, bed and bag set for our son. Uh, We had furniture. We had clothes. The ladies of the church came and took what was left because we had a closet that wasn't touched by the fire. But, of course, when you have soot and smell and uh, fire trucks hosing everything down, it's a mess, to say the least. But they did all that laundry and just tried their best to help us. And we saw 
just people come through and, and help us. We had so much the more that we, could, we didn't have room for it. And that's our God. Amen. He shows up and he shows out for his people. Amen. Even when it seems like we've experienced loss, he sends us new people, new friends. Say, for instance, you lose a friend, well, now you gain a godly friend. Amen. Amen. Maybe a family member turns their back on you and God sends you someone special who's going to love you like Christ and who's going to lift you up when others would put you down. We lose physical things. The enemy tries to attack. I mean, we're tithers. We have tithers, right? But sometimes things in the natural can happen and we cry out to God and say, Lord, help us. We need this. We have needed this. Help us. I turn to you for my sustenance. I honor you with my finances. I'm a good steward with what you've given me. Can you trust me with a little more because I just lost this? And he always does. We are not a people of lack. If you think about it, we are so blessed. We have so much. You guys all look great. You've got clothes on. You, you look healthy. You know, we get to eat. We get to come in this beautiful building. God provides. He is Jehovah Jireh. He provides for us. Amen. And I want to encourage you. If you feel like the enemy's been taking too much from you, maybe attacking your mind, taking some of your peace, attacking your body, taking some of your health, your finances, whatever it looks like, God can restore. God can give you even more than what you had Amen. when we put our trust in him. He will see us through. Just got to shake off, you know, us getting in our stinking thinking and our whining and complaining. Because sometimes, you know, the battle seems like we're surrounded. And that being said, let's, let's turn to another example here. Let's turn to 2 Kings 6. Second Kings 6, we're going to read verse 16 and 17. One more time. Let's say fresh eyes. Fresh eyes. Fresh eyes. 2 Kings 6, verse 16 says, And he answered, Fear not, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So Elisha prayed for opened eyes of his servant. Sometimes it just feels like we're surrounded. And we can't see because we lose hope. Sometimes, you know, things get clouded. But here we know, I mean, there is a host of angels. They are not there. I mean, I, oh, I don't know if you saw last night when Pastor Chris was talking about the angels going, holy, holy, holy. And they do that. But it was, it was hilarious. And I, I love Pastor Chris's um, humor. It just it tickled me. But these angels have a lot of jobs, and, and they are all important, and they are to worship God with reverence and honor, but there are angels that are for us as well, Amen. to protect us, to equip us and help us. We're to put on the full armor of God ourselves. I mean, we have to activate our faith. We have to stand. We have to battle, but there are angels that we don't even know, right? We might be entertaining angels among us. They're in this church, and they have assignments, Amen. and it was just beautiful that when this young man saw the enemy surrounding them, encamped about them, and it seemed hopeless that Elisha knew to pray, to renew his faith and hope, and to open his spiritual eyes, and to say, look, son, there are more on our side. God is for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Right. Amen. Right. Amen. And we're world overcomers. We have the authority and power of Jesus we have the Holy Spirit that equips us and helps us when we're battling, even the small battles. But I'm telling you, when you're going through some hard stuff, God is for us, and those angels are around you. 
All we have to do is activate our faith and call out to him. Amen. He is faithful. He is faithful to hear us. Amen. Amen. And, and we have scripture that talks about our prayers going up to heaven and the enemy even trying to divert those. Keep praying. Don't stop praying. Amen. Don't stop battling. And you will get victory. And ask God, say, let me see this with fresh eyes. Let me see this situation in a new way. Help me regain focus because I'm all over the place. I mean, I even think about when uh, Peter uh, took his eyes off Jesus with the storm around him. It just took him looking at his circumstance for him to start to sink. But what happened? What caused things to change? He cried out to God. And that's, that's what we need to train ourselves to do. When things go wrong, do we talk about it to someone else? Do we whine, complain? Do we call someone out, up and, and go off and try to get it all out? Or do we turn to God Amen. and just say, God, things look bleak, but nothing's too great for you. Right. I need you. I need fresh eyes. And, and there's times where I'm like, Lord, give me new battle strategies. Help me beat this thing because I've come at it this way. <laughs> And, you know, I was pretty good for a minute. But I need new battle strategies because I want to I wanna get victory at it this time. Amen. Amen. So I, I appreciated that Elisha showed, and probably, you know, discipling this young man, this is what we do. We pray. We ask God to see things differently. We cast off fear. Amen. When we lose hope, we see no good. Right. So will you set your eyes on Jesus like Peter and get victory, or will you set your eyes on the circumstance? Will you give way to hope, or will you give way to fear from these examples? Put your hope in God, and he will see you through. So let's, let's look about setting our eyes on Jesus for a moment and seeing the good in God. Turn with me to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Psalm 27, we're going to read verse 1 through 3 and verse 13. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen. Hallelujah. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, just like what Elisha was seeing, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. 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 So that young servant got to see that, hey, the enemy's encamped around me, but my God is much more mighty, and he shows up, and we're going to get victory. We're going to get victory. And I love the rest of that story because they actually got to minister to their enemies and win them over. So it wasn't like they just went and slew them all. God helped them, and they, were, they ended up using it as a testimony, we'll just say. And can't we do that? Shouldn't we all have these testimonies where God brought us through these attacks, these, these attacks that just seem bleak and hopeless? And we can turn that around and minister to someone else, Amen. someone else who, who's go, going through some hard times. Isn't that what our Christian walk is all about is testifying of the Lord, winning the lost, showing them that how we maintain the light of Christ within us. Amen. 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 There's another example. You don't, you don't have to turn here. You can just write this one down. But Psalm 66, 5 in the NLT version says, Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for his people. Amen. You know, and um, Zechariah today during his Bible study, he, he was saying, uh, 
taste and see that the Lord is good. I was like, there's another one. Taste and see that the Lord is good. See him for yourself. Try him for yourself. Taste his goodness. Amen. I was like, there's another one. I didn't even write that one down. You go, boy. All right. So our first point this evening was see his salvation and deliverance. Our second point was when we lose hope, we see no good. And now we know how to see good in God. My third point tonight is sometimes you may see but not possess. Sometimes you may see but not possess. Why is that? Let's turn to Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34, we're going to go to verse 4. And while we do that, um, I'm going to talk to you a moment while you turn there. In the book of Numbers, and to be exact, Numbers 20, verse 8 through 12, you don't have to turn there, but we read about Moses disobeying God. Uh, he was he was told to to smoke the rock once. He ended up doing it twice. That's just a quick lesson for us to learn that when God tells us to do something, obey it, no more, no less. Do exactly as He commands, and you will be blessed for it. But in this situation, in Deuteronomy thirty four, verse four and five, it says, "And the Lord said unto him." This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. And then it continues to say, so Moses died. We read about Moses disobeying God. It was because of this disobedience that Moses got to see the land from afar, but he did not get to enter into it. So how does that apply to us, spiritually speaking, with our spiritual eyes? Sometimes God will give you a vision. Sometimes he has promises waiting for us, but we may never see them come to pass or may only get a glimpse of it and never possess it because of disobedience. This can also be because we take our eyes off God and lose the vision altogether. I don't know about you, but there's promises for me. There's been promotion given to me, praise God. I'm just obedient, but I don't want someone else getting that. I I don't want to see someone have something that I could have had or that was given as a vision to my husband and us never see it because we took our eyes off God, we got distracted, Um, maybe we looked at something, we'll just use Lot as an example, the grass seemed greener on the other side, so we get off track and then we miss everything that God has for us. We don't get to go in and possess what God promised or what that vision was. And we may never know. I mean, we'll know in the end. But I don't want to get to heaven and God show me what I could have had, what I could have possessed, what I could have done with my life. And unfortunately, whether he, whether he knew he was disobeying, disobeying or not, I know my Bible said... Um, when I was studying this, that even if it wasn't intentional, he still disobeyed God. He, you know, he could have, we're all human. He could, he could have thought, well, more water will come out. I'll be able to provide for the people more if I do it a second time. God did it once. He can do it again. And I'm not putting Moses down, but he still disobeyed. God said, smote it once. He did it twice. And because of that disobedience, he never got to fully possess the land. So sometimes you may see, but not possess. Let's purpose in our hearts that we're going to see all the goodness that God has for us. Amen. Amen. We're taking it. We're possessing it. It's ours. We're going to see the goodness of God and see him and his promises come to pass. And in the end, you know, as we endure, we will 
finish our race and we will see him in the end and get to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen, Miss Sandra? Amen. Okay, how am I doing on time? My goodness. Okay, I'm moving on to point four. We'll just speed up. Point four. This is a good one. I really like this one. Number four, stubborn people don't see. Stubborn people don't see, spiritually speaking. <laughs> Amen. So hardening our hearts to the messages of our holy men and women of God causes us to lose sight of all God has for us and will ultimately bring judgment. So let me give you this point. I'm going to read this to you. You can write this down or you can turn here, but it's Jeremiah 3.15. It says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So God will give us pastors to feed us, and they're according to his heart. So when we come against the men and women of God and become stubborn to the word and the feeding, well, I don't want to eat that. Well, that's not my favorite. Well, that just doesn't taste good. doesn't make me feel good inside. Well, I don't think that God cares about that. Amen. He gave you that pastor for a reason. Amen. So do I be stubborn? Receive of them. But we know that God's people at times can be stubborn, and we know that people in general can be stubborn. But when you become stubborn, you lose spiritual sight. Amen? That's right. Well, let's expound on that. Turn with me, Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5. I'm going to read through a couple of these quickly, if you don't mind. We're going to go to Jeremiah 5, verse 21 and 23. And then we're going to jump over to Isaiah 6. If you want to mark your places. And I'm going to go in and read. So Jeremiah 5 and Isaiah 6. Jeremiah 5, 21 through 23 says... Hear this, you foolish, stubborn, and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone away. Amen. So the Lord here is saying, you have eyes, but do not see. And he calls them foolish, stubborn, and senseless people when you do that. Yeah. I don't want to be that. There's a reason why our pastor is given messages on our behalf. Amen. It's a word in due season. Mm -hmm. It's to rebuke. It's to exhort. It's to sometimes chastise. It's to sharpen us. It's to make us better. Yeah. So we, we shouldn't be offended by it. We should welcome it and say, okay, Lord, give me eyes to see. Give me eyes to see what this, what this means. And... and Help me hear it, help me understand it, and then help me accomplish it and apply it. Amen. Isaiah 6, and I'm, I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. Isaiah 6, 8 through 11 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go, and who will go for us? Then said I, Isaiah, saying, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. So God here warns 
Isaiah, that his ministry is falling on deaf ears and with shut eyes. And because of that, this results in captivity and death. And in fact, if we, if we read on about the Babylonian captivity, only a tenth of the people ever found their way back. So we can deduct from that that one who strays from the truth of God, that he or she may never find their way back. You can get left field easy. You can listen to a false doctrine. You can be led away by your flesh. You could say, that's too hard. I don't want to go there. Or, oh, well, that's a cult. They're, they're trying to control me. Or I don't like that message. Or I, I, don't, I don't want to dress up on Sundays for church. I don't want to honor God or the house of God. I mean, there's a lot that can lead us astray. We can get lazy. I mean, there, there's a million things that the enemy will try to use to distract us and deter us from all that he's put in us. From everything that he's invested in us. And from the, the promises and the things we can possess if we just hold on. Amen. And if we keep our eyes open. But again, when one strays from the truth of God, he or she may never find their way back. So these two verses show that are what stubborn sight can do when one feels wise in their own eyes. And that's found in Proverbs twelve fifteen. We can't be wise in our own eyes. We can't. We can, but it's not going to get us anywhere. Wisdom is the beginning of fearing the Lord. So we have to fear God and ask him to allow us to see everything that he's trying to tell us and show us and where he's trying to lead us. Amen. Amen. Okay, Isaiah 32. We're going to go, we're going to hit one more point and then I'm going to move on. Isaiah 32, and we're going to be reading verse 3 and 4, and also verse 16 through 18. So we're going to jump a little bit. So that's Isaiah 32, 3 through 4, and verses 16 through 18. This is the promise for the righteous. And when we say righteous, we're talking about those who are in right standing with God and hearken to his voice. So this is the promise. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. And the ears of them that hear shall hearken. They'll listen. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge. And the tongue of the stammerer shall be ready to speak plainly. And skipping on, it says, Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and the righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of the righteous shall be peace. And the effect of the righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Amen. Don't you want to be counted as righteous and live in peace? Amen. To have the effect of quietness and assurance. That blessed assurance. That's right. That's right. So let's not be stubborn. Because when you're stubborn, you don't see. You just see what you want to see. You're right. They're wrong. You become puffed up. You give way to pride. You, you just you shut down. You become blind in a sense. Your vision becomes cloudy. I'm, I'm sure we've all been there where it says, you know, someone says, uh, I'm so mad I can't see straight. <laughs> well, there it is. Because you get puffed up in pride, you, you get lost in emotion, and it overtakes you, and then you can't see clearly. We could say you can't think clearly. That's why we have to put our mind on Christ, focus on him to see us through. But, but that's what happens. When we're stubborn, you're not going to see things clearly. You're not going to see how the other person may be trying to help you, may just be giving you a word of wisdom, some advice, some godly counsel just trying to be a friend, trying to cause you from hurting your life. You just, it's that pride and offense and stubbornness. Amen. Okay, let's jump to point five. 
And this is going to be in Matthew, if you want to go on and turn to Matthew 13. So this is Jesus speaking, um, and this is regarding the parables that's being discussed with the disciples, just setting the scene for you. But point five says, Jesus wants us to see and hear his truth. Jesus wants us to see and hear his truth. Matthew 13, verses 16 through 17, said, it says, Blessed are your eyes, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. This goes beyond just the physical seeing and hearing. This implies that an inner spiritual perception of truth is taking place. God wants to reveal to us the truth of his word and the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He wants that. He desires to know you more intimately and for you to know him. Amen. That's like a parent who buys a child a gift. They can't wait until they open it. They can't wait to see what's inside. They want to see their reaction. They want them to have the goodness. I mean, me as a parent, I can't wait for Christmas to watch my kids open things. Because you just want to bless them. And that's our God. He wants to reveal his word to us. He wants to reveal the truth. He wants to, to show us the mysteries of his kingdom. And he wants us to be excited about it. He wants us to know him more. But this even warns us that even the righteous men, that their eyes can be dimmed. And that sometimes if they're not careful to keep them open and focused on God, that their eyes may be dimmed. They may not see. We know of many ministers who, get, who stop praying for, for their relationship with God. They stop taking things to the Lord, and they get focused on the ministry, and their sight gets off. Now, praise God, a lot of them will come back into focus. Maybe something happens, gets their attention, but then others lose the vision altogether. Focus on maybe a little bit more of the world, maybe on money and fame. We've seen this happen in the body. They lose focus, and then they stop seeing what the Holy Spirit is, is showing them and what God is showing them and telling them. They, they stop up their ears, and they're, they're wise in their own eyes, and they be, begin to be puffed up in knowledge and, um, and lose sight on the vision and what God had told them to do when they began. So let that not be us. Amen. Spiritually seeing and hearing will bless our lives and can bless those around us when we share God's truth. What we've seen and heard. That's, that's a testimony. We share what we've seen and heard as a body of believers. This will cause us to have a closer walk with God as well. So when, we, when our eyes are open, now God will show people things as they you know, walk with God for themselves. But sometimes God will use us because he sh showed us and then we're good stewards and we say, hey, you know what? The Lord showed me this. Let me tell you about it. Let me show you where that's at in the Bible. Or let me tell you, I've been through something like this. Let me show you what God showed me about it and how I got victory. So what we're responsible for what we see, spiritually speaking. Amen? Okay, and my last point, I'm running a little late here. But this is the last one. Number six, the pure in heart sees God. The pure in heart sees God. Amen. You don't have to turn here because uh, this is really quick. But Matthew 5, verse 8 says, Blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. So there's the point right there, Pastor. The pure in heart sees God. Matthew eight or Matthew five eight says, "Blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God." 
Amen. 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 The pure, selfless. So when we care for others, that makes us more godly. When we prefer our brother and sister in Christ, that makes us more pure. Where we're not selfish and, and it's all about me. It's a great point. Thank you for that. Let's look at Matthew 6. So just a little bit over Matthew 6, verse 22 through 24. Matthew 6, 22 through 24. So again, we're talking about the pure in heart sees God. And Matthew 6 says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I know that we've heard this scripture time and time again when exhorting on tithes and offerings and serving money, but I want you to see it with fresh eyes tonight and see, see what I saw in this, okay? So just, just go here with me. If a man's spiritual sight is healthy and his affections are directed towards the kingdom, his whole being will be without blemish. Single eye here that they're talking about, it refers to a fixed vision, meaning his eyes are set on, set on God and sees God. That's that light. So when, when we focus on God, when we don't allow anything to divert that and we have that single mentality, our eyes are stayed and affixed on Jesus, then we will absorb his light and reflect his light and darkness will have no place in us. Amen. That evil eye that they were referring to, it refers to the deception of vision, darkening the mind, and focusing on the things of darkness rather than the light. Then it speaks of spiritual double vision, because that's when we serve two masters. We go here, we go here, we go here, we go here. Uh, This feels pretty good, but this looks better. And, and that, that double-mindedness, that's spiritual double vision. Right. And it's when one believes that one can serve two masters. It diverts one's sight back and forth between light and darkness. That's a compromised person. And we know how the Lord feels about lukewarmness right. and those who compromise. Amen. So if you imagine that, that uh, spiritual double vision... When you're going back, forth, back, forth, if you're even thinking about walking, this makes a person unstable. You'll ultimately fall. Has anyone ever went to get their eyes checked? They're dilated, and then you got those silly glasses on, and you feel unstable as soon as you put them on. They're dark, and they, they control the amount of light that can come through and penetrate. we got to cast those things off. Spiritually speaking, don't allow the enemy to put dark glasses over you. Amen. Don't be fooled. Don't be duped. Be single-eyed. Keep, keep your eyes focused on Jesus and his light, and you'll reflect that light. You'll absorb it and reflect it everywhere you go. Amen. And you'll spiritually see without the clouded vision, without the, the dark glasses, so to speak. Amen. So in closing... We must keep our eyes full of light and focus on God and the things of God. Do not focus on your circumstances or on the things of the world that can dim your sight or cause spiritual blindness. Amen. Amen. So we said tonight, see his salvation and deliverance. Know that God can deliver you. When we lose hope, we see no good. So keep and cling to hope and see the goodness of God. And then we also said that sometimes you may see but not possess. Make sure that what we're seeing as far as the things of God, the vision and the promises that he's given us, to possess it, to keep it, to hold tight to it. 
and to fix our eyes on Jesus. Don't be stubborn, number four, because when you're stubborn, you're wise in your own eyes, in your own sight. So don't be that. And then number five, Jesus wants us to see and hear his truth. Ask God to show you. Continue to read the word. Ask him to reveal the, the keys to the kingdom, all of these mysteries. Ask him to show himself more clearly to you. And then lastly, be pure in heart and you will see God.